Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and colleagues, I would like to welcome you to this final dissemination event of the research project Helicopter Offshore Operations Flotation Systems. My name is Willy Siegel and I act as the moderator for today's webinar. As an employee of the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, I am delighted to be here with you all. Let me begin by introducing our esteemed speakers who will share their insights during this session. My colleague, Emily Lewis, is a renowned expert in helicopter safety and offshore operations at EASA. She has acted as the technical lead from EASA in this project. Mike Lee has acted as the project owner from Dart Aerospace. And that aerospace has been selected to implement this project following a public tender procedure. Now, our agenda for today is as follows. My colleague Emily will debrief you on the project scope, the reasons for the, initi for the initiation of this project, and on the specific project objectives. Then Mike will give an overview of the project activities, the deliverables, and the key findings of this research project. I hand then over back to Emily, who will share with us the planned follow-up actions after this research project will be successfully concluded. And then, colleagues, there will be the questions and answer sessions, and we encourage an active participation from uh, you, please feel free to submit your questions using the Slido app, which is integrated into this webinar and is already open. Before we proceed, let me briefly introduce the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. EASA is the regulatory body responsible for ensuring the highest standards of aviation safety across Europe. Our mission is to promote a safe, efficient and environmental sustainable air transport. As part of our commitment to advance aviation safety, EASA actively engages also in research projects that address critical safety challenges. Today's project on helicopter flotation system exemplifies our dedications to innovation and to safety uh, enhancement. Let me also highlight that this project has been funded by the European Union through the Horizon 2020 research program, which emphasizes that the European Union is also dedicated to support aviation safety topics. Lastly, an administrative note, this webinar is being recorded and the presentation slides as well as the recordings will be available on the event website, uh, on the project page and uh, on uh, the event website at the EVASA site. Once again, thank you for joining us. Let's make this dissemination event a platform for knowledge exchange, collaboration and progress. And now I hand over to my colleague, Emily. Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you, Willie. So I will start by giving an overview of the research scope and objectives before passing over to Mike to explain the research activities and results. So as explained by Willie, the research project received funding from the European Union Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. The overall objective is to provide answers to technical issues regarding the feasibility of providing a step change in occupant survivability following capsize of a helicopter through the introduction of an air pocket scheme utilising flotation units mounted high up on the helicopter fuselage. I will explain more about the background of this objective in the following slides. So following in the EASA tender, this contract was awarded to Dart Aerospace. It initially had a three-year contract that was later extended by six months for completion in December this year. The value of the contract is nearly one and a half million euros. More information can be found on the dedicated internet site, which following the webinar will include a link to this presentation and the webinar recording. So regarding the background, it is well known that capsized resistance is extremely challenging to achieve in all emergency situations due to the high center of gravity configuration of rotorcraft. Reviews of accident reports has confirmed that following a capsize, 
the most likely cause of fatalities is drowning. This is due to the incompatibility between human breath hold capability and the required time to escape. This incompatibility is even more evident in cold water. Extensive research has already been performed in the feasibility of providing an air pocket in the cabin. So this air pocket provides survivors more time following capsize to orientate themselves, deploy emergency breathing systems if carried, and to find a suitable emergency egress route. These research activities have already demonstrated that an air pocket can be achieved with the addition of high mounted EFS. A capsized floating attitude with sufficient portion of the cabin above the waterline is feasible for all the occupants. The sizing and location of the HEFS has been assessed and also the feasibility of the solution has been validated by wave tank testing to confirm the hydrodynamic performance. In addition, human subject trials have been carried out to establish the feasibility of egress with the rotorcraft on its side. So in 2016, IASA published an NPA for public consultation for an update to the initial airworthiness specifications, CS27 and CS29, to enhance occupant survivability in the event of a ditching or survivable water impact. This included a proposal to require enhanced post-capsized features such as the air pocket. So it was clear from the public consultation that technical issues exist that require further investigation or before introducing the air pocket requirement, which is the subject of this research. So what was the scope of the research? So the aim was to provide answers to the following five technical questions. Firstly, system design. Can an HEFS be designed for a reference CS27 category A and CS29 helicopter such that the target air pocket is achieved? Deployment. Does the risk of inadvertent deployment in flight present a significant flight safety issue due to the potential for interference with the main rotor? Heat resistance. Are there materials available for the different components of the HEFS which are sufficiently heat and puncture resistant? Aerodynamics. Does the reference design, so the size, location and shape of the stowed HEFS result in unsurmountable negative aerodynamic effects? And finally, integration. Does the implementation of the HEFS produce any significant challenges regarding overall usability or integration aspects? So now I'll pass over to Mike, who will cover the research activities and results. Thank you very much, Emily, for the introduction. Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Lee, and I'm the Flotation Business Unit Manager for Dart Aerospace. 24 minutes and 37 seconds. That is the world record of underwater breath hold, a title held by a professional diver, Vladimir Sobat. In an ideal situation, the average adult can hold their breath for between 30 and 90 seconds. Now visualize this with me. The aircraft you're in just hit the water and capsized. It's dark, it's cold, you're disoriented. How do you think this will impact your ability to hold your breath as you try to egress a helicopter? That exactly raises the question, can a high mounted emergency float system defined herein as HEFS be introduced on a CS-27 and on a CS-29 aircraft which will ensure breathable air for passengers following a ditching and capsizing event. This slide presents a systematic approach to the HEFS feasibility assessment. The team began by defining two reference helicopters and establishing available design space, which drove the baseline requirements of the float design. The process involved iterative stages, including float design, volume adjustments, air pocket assessment, and computer simulated buoyancy analysis. A full scale test was then conducted to validate the design in a real world scenario, ensuring the accuracy of the simulation. Following this, a certification impact check was performed in order to ensure that there were no major challenges leading to the establishment of the final float design. 
Here you can see a CS-27 reference aircraft. And the reference aircraft that we selected for this program was an EC-135. Furthermore, for the CS-29 aircraft, we selected an AW-139 as the ideal reference helicopter. So several key design constraints, such as rescue hoist location, passenger seat configuration, engine inlets, exhaust locations, access panels, emergency exit locations, and inherent buoyancy were assessed on each of the reference aircraft. The float concept was designed to avoid interference with optional equipment such as the rescue hoist and obviously the rotor blades. The overall volume and location of the float bag is based on the air pocket analysis and the worst case heat conditions. The pod structure, which is shown in green in the image below, must be tied to primary structure and its size is based on an established float to volume pod ratio. The exterior of the cover of the pod is optimized to minimize drag and maximize downstream pressure recovery and to avoid interference with any critical sensors, components, inlets, and outlets. Finally, the inflation system utilizes a high pressure gas charge, which is from an electrically actuated reservoir, which is used to inflate the float system. As I mentioned previously, we conducted a computer simulated buoyancy analysis to determine the stable resting position of the rotorcraft in water. To ensure a conservative analysis, we performed one of the configurations with a critical compartment of the HEFS uninflated and another analysis with a critical compartment of the standard EFS uninflated. The analysis results indicated that the CS29 configuration can maintain a stable side floating attitude, as well as a fully stable capsized position. However, in the CS27 configuration, there is no stable side floating position. Essentially, upon capsizing, the CS27 aircraft will rotate into a fully stable but capsized position with a very much nose down attitude, which is shown in the bottom right image on the screen. Initially, we focused on determining the optimal air pocket shape based on EASA's notice of proposed amendment. Specifically, the minimum air pocket volume per passenger, which was defined as the NPA 2016-01 air pocket. Our preliminary air pocket results showed that in various scenarios, there was interference between the air pockets and also with the aircraft itself. It's important to note that for the analysis, we took a conservative approach and assumed that the occupants could not cross any rows of seats. In the top image on the right, you can see the NPA 2016-01 proposed air pocket. And on the bottom Im image, you can see a simulated um, air pocket analysis, which demonstrates numerous areas of interference. Based on the results from the previous analysis, which indicated interference issues between air pockets and the aircraft, we proceeded to develop a recommended air pocket design. For this recommended air pocket shape, we utilized data from the 95th percentile of male head dimensions to establish a tapered air pocket. And we can also consider the occupants of body volume our analysis of the recommended air pocket design demonstrated no air pocket interference with the proposed tapered air pocket. As you can see in the image on the top right is the tapered air pocket, as well as the dimensions that were used to establish that air pocket. And in the bottom right image, you can see the body profiles of the occupants in a capsized position. We proceeded with full-scale testing to confirm the accuracy of our computer simulations. These tests utilize the CS-29 reference helicopter fixture and aim to assess the helicopter's stability and the HEFS performance in various scenarios. The testing encompassed the validation of the upright floating attitude, the side floating attitude, 
and the fully inverted attitude. Dynamic tests were also conducted to replicate the rotorcraft capsizing. Following a forced capsizing, we observed consistently the helicopter maintaining a side floating position, which you'll see in a later video. During the test, one notable observation was that while the HEFS restraints and the design effectively withstood the impact loads, they did allow for excess movement of the HEFS structure. So here's a brief video demonstrating the capsizing impact uh, during real world testing. I'm going to pause on this slide for a second just to allow the video to run through uh, a couple times. So now the purpose of this slide is to provide a side-by-side -side comparison of the computer simulation and the actual test results. Just for reference, the float bags aren't shown in the simulated images, just for added clarity. Now, during our testing, we observed a difference in the helicopter's, helicopter's lateral attitude when in the side floating position, which is the second image from the bottom. This difference was primarily attributed to the insufficient retention of the HEFS to the test fixture, as I previously mentioned. However, it is very important to note that all other test results that were unaffected by the HEFS retention closely aligned with the computer simulations. So on the column on the left-hand side of these images, you can see the buoyancy analysis results. And on the right-hand two columns, you can see the real world test results. In conclusion, our computer simulated results demonstrated a close correlation with the real world test results. The revised tapered air pocket definition enables the feasible design of an HEFS that ensures an adequate air pocket for enhanced occupant survivability in both CS27 CAT A and CS29 reference helicopters even when accounting for the most conservative situations, such as the damaged or uninflated critical float compartments. Our test revealed that the CS-29 reference helicopter maintains stability in both the side floating and fully capsized positions. However, for the CS-27 CAT A reference helicopter, stability was only observed in a fully capsized position with no stable side floating position identified. So, so far we've confirmed that a high mounted emergency float system is a feasible solution. Now, our next step is to make sure that the float deployment system does not pose a significant safety risk to the rotorcraft. We examined specialty reliability framework tailored for the HEFS. Our methodology incorporated a rotor clearance assessment and puncture resistance tests. This systematic approach ensured that the deployment system designed achieved an optimal balance of performance, cost effectiveness, and most importantly, dependable reliability. The design objective employs water immersion sensors and rotorcraft main RPM sensors, along with float arming logic that is integrated with the primary EFS. The activation circuit aims to meet reliability requirements using non-complex hardware, removing the need for design assurance level specifications. This approach ensures a balance between reliability, cost, and simplicity, while still maintaining clear enunciation of any active input path. In terms of inadvertent deployment, the design stipulates that the HEFS must not activate during flight or before all necessary conditions are met. The probability requirement of a functional failure must be extremely improbable at 10 to the minus nine per flight hour. Regarding a failure to deploy, the HFS is designed to operate as intended upon the fulfillment of a trigger criteria. The likelihood of a functional failure in this scenario must be extremely remote at 10 to the minus seven per flight hour. In order to meet the required reliability targets, 
The HEFS is designed with durable, inflatable materials to withstand punctures and maintain positive rotor clearance. A detailed system design was performed that highlighted two primary options for system activation. One, the automatic activation that requires no pilot intervention, utilizing float immersion circuits in combination with load rotor RPM signals. Or two, a manual activation through the HEFS deployment switch triggered by the flight crew and also in combination with the low rotor RPM. The analysis has showed that achieving an inadvertent deployment rate of 10 to the minus nine per flight hour is feasible and the conceptual design has exceeded that target. Likewise, we've determined that a failure to deploy rate of 10 to the minus seven per flight hour is also feasible when factoring in a 30% chance of capsizing within five minutes or four to the minus six per flight hour when not factoring in a 30% chance of capsizing within five minutes. These reliability targets in the activation system can be achieved without the need for software or complex hardware. As you can see here on the CS29 rotorcraft with the rotor in the most drooped position, we have positive clearance of approximately 160 millimeters. And similarly, on the CS29 rotorcraft, we have approximately 100 millimeters of positive clearance between the rotor and the float bag. The float, excuse me, the, the fabric float bag material that has been tested in accordance with the life raft standard ETSO 2C505 has demonstrated results that exceed the test requirements by a factor of approximately six. Future testing will need to comply with a newly developed life raft standard, which is ASD STAN PREN 4886. Now, considering the HEFS potential exposure to high temperature, it is essential to select materials for construction that can ensure such temperature extremes are met. In order to analyze the effects of elevated temperatures on possible primary materials utilized in the HEFS construction, we first demonstrated the temperature requirements followed by selecting a series of materials. Then the assortment of various materials and fabrics were then exposed to elevated temperatures in order to down select optimal materials. Finally, the down selected materials were exposed to simulated thermal cycles. Now, in order to define the temperature requirements, we utilized heat map data from an existing EC225, which is shown in the top right image. This was done to establish conservative baseline fuselage surface temperature. This baseline was then transposed onto the reference CS29 helicopter which displays a peak temperature of 200 degrees Celsius. The middle image is the transposed based on the exhaust duct location, and the bottom image is transposed based on a worst case heat condition uh, based on the HEFS mounting location. Now, in this test, we conducted experiments to gather heat transfer and physical degradation data. We exposed, we exposed both composite material and float fabrics to direct high temperature of 200 degrees Celsius for approximately 30 minutes. We also assessed the float bag's fabric ability to retain air at a pressure of exceeding two PSI at the elevated temperature. Furthermore, we visually examined the composite material samples to gauge the extent of deterioration following exposure to these test conditions. As you can see in the table below, among the composite materials, our composite material E exhibited the most significant capability to reduce heat transfer, indicating its superior insulation properties. On the other hand, fabric material C showed no visible signs of deterioration or loss in air retention properties, suggesting its resilience under these harsh conditions. 
So in terms of the thermal cycle, we preliminary carried out three phases. So phase A was a simulated ascent where we brought the coupons up to a 200 degree Celsius temperature. Phase B was a simulated flight phase where the temperature was maintained for approximately two and a half hours. And finally, phase C, which is a simulated ditching and float activation. The heating element was turned off, the composite sample was removed from the thermal test fixture, and then it was immediately pressurized to above two PSI. What we took away from this was that industry standard fabric and composite materials have demonstrated the ability to retain performance at elevated temperatures and preliminary endurance testing has also demonstrated favorable results. Industry standard hardware and manufacturing techniques used in conjunction with these materials remain operational when subject to high heat conditions. And as part of this research program, thermal cycling will be performed and it is recommended to conduct comprehensive advanced age testing on any future float bag materials being considered for this purpose in order to rigorously assess thermal resilience and optimal weight to heat resistance. As you can see in the bottom image on the left hand side, this is a photo of the composite panel following the test. In the middle image, you can see the fabric or the float bag inflatable following the test. And on the bottom right is a pressure relief valve also following test. All three of these products demonstrated optimal results. Now we will move into the aerodynamic aspect of integrating an HEFS. To assess the aerodynamic impact of introducing an HEFS onto the rotorcraft, a thoroughly developed CFD analysis was performed to evaluate the delta effects of the rotorcraft with and without an HEFS. The main aspects that were assessed were aerodynamic effects such as engine inlet disturbances, impacts to handling qualities, and impacts on performance. In the images below, you can see the relatively small size of the HEFS pod. The location of the HEFS pods were qualitatively assessed in comparison to existing helicopter modifications and equipment such as the rescue hoist that you can see in the image on the right. The HEFS aerodynamic impact was expected to be similar to or less than that of the rescue hoists currently utilized on both CS-29 and CS-27 offshore fleets. A steady state CFD model was developed, then validated by means of certain data made available by the OEMs, such as static pressure distribution and power and drag curves. The model verification was then performed based on open source data. A speed of 80 knots to 140 knots were selected for the analysis, which are within the validated speed range. The worst case aerodynamic center of gravity location and takeoff weights were assessed. We assessed the aft center of gravity, medium takeoff weight for stability analysis, and maximum takeoff weight for performance analysis. These analysis were also carried out on varying altitudes from sea level up to 5,000 feet. The weight propagation was compared for a model with and without HEFS pods. It was noticed that there was a negligible difference found regarding weight propagation downstream of the HEFS, as you can see on the image on the right, and the flow is also similar at the horizontal stabilizer. Pressure recovery was also assessed at the engine inlet for a CS-29 rotorcraft, and it can be concluded that the HEFS pods have a minimal impact on the quality of the engine inlet flow. Force and forces and moments resulting from the CFD simulations have been post-processed with a flight mechanics tool. Outcomes have been presented as a percentage delta between the baseline CS-29 reference helicopter and the helicopter with an HEFS. 
To assess impacts on handling quality, the delta longitudinal static margins were calculated. To assess impacts on performance, the following was calculated. Delta in drag, delta in fuel consumption, and delta in rate of climb with one engine inoperative. So as you can see in the chart below, the blue line in the graph illustrates the drag curve of the baseline rotorcraft, and the yellow line represents the drag curve with the EFS. As you can see, even at the vertical green line, which indicates v &E, the impact of the HEFS on the fuselage drag is negligible. Furthermore, the research indicates a negligible power delta regarding longitudinal static margins and power required. There will also be a negligible effect on rate of climb during OEI conditions. So in terms of aerodynamic conclusions, we can take away that the analysis suggests HFS installation can comply with relevant CS27 and 29 requirements with minimal effects on static stability, rate of climb, and fuel consumption. Aerodynamic effects of the HEFS is not likely to be more intrusive than existing equipment. For CS27 CAT A helicopters, limited space may result in less aerodynamically optimized pod designs compared to a CS29 helicopter. Retrofitting the HEFS may have a more noticeable aerodynamic impact compared to integrating it into a newly developed helicopter. It's also advisable to validate the aerodynamics of the final pod design via a flight test campaign as part of future HGFS design and certification programs. Now we ask, does the implementation of an HGFS produce any significant challenges regarding overall usability or integration? So in terms of integration considerations, the main things for retrofitting an HEFS are installing the HEFS in the most ideal location for buoyancy, existing inlets, outlets, and ancillary equipment cannot be covered or obstructed, the outer shape of the pod should be aerodynamically optimized, structural integration is a key aspect, egress routes should not be obstructed by the floats, Vibration and shock spectrums must be evaluated. Cost effectiveness, maintenance, and obviously interference with the fire zones. As I mentioned, it is critical that the HEFS does not obstruct emergency, accurate, uh, emergency egress procedures or routes. So as you can see in the images below, we've highlighted in red the CS29 uh, egress paths as well as in blue on the CS-27 aircraft below. Emergency exits shown on the CS-29 aircraft are primarily above the fully capsized waterline. And on the CS-27, emergency exits are approximately 30 centimeters below the waterline, as shown on the image on the right. So, each of these reference helicopter HEFS were designed around the most predominant equipment used in combination for offshore operations. It's also important to note that reinforcement patches may be used to further protect the float bag from sharp fuselage protrusions. So in terms of maintenance and continuing airworthiness, the main considerations here are the maintenance of the HEFS itself and then the impact of the HFS on routine maintenance and other systems. Most maintenance tasks of the HFS are comparable to the tasks for the primary EFS. All maintenance tasks for the EFS, HEFS can be performed during scheduled maintenance intervals. Design and retention methods used a lot, utilized on each platform may vary drastically. However, the intent of the HFS is to limit the impact on routine maintenance actions and to have removable installation time that is comparable to or less than standard EFS pods. It is anticipated that the HFS can be designed for existing rotorcraft to avoid removal 
in order to perform routine daily maintenance on CS29 rotorcraft. However, this design objective may be considerably more challenging on CS29 platforms due to space restrictions. This requirement would be more feasible on newly developed aircraft. In terms of cost effectiveness, the cost effectiveness of developing and manufacturing an AGFS will be more economical if it is performed in conjunction with the development of a standard EFS, as opposed to a system retrofit that introduces the AGFS independently. This is largely due to the common flight test and certification campaigns that can be performed. The kit cost will be slightly higher due to the integration of the necessary structural provisions and maintenance costs are anticipated to be proportional to the, to the standard EFS baseline, which results in it being about 60% less than the cost of a EFS system. Preliminary estimates for the HEFS removable provisions indicate that the CS27 system will weigh around 49 kilograms and that the CS29 system will weigh approximately 55 kilograms. So in terms of integration conclusions, the HEFS can be designed such that obstruction, obstruction of emergency egress routes is avoided. However, it is important to design suitable retention methods to avoid deflection of the inflated floats once in contact with water. A survey of the current 20, uh, CS27 CAD A offshore fleet has shown that installation of a retrofit AGFS will be more challenging on a CS27 aircraft. However, retrofitting CS29 helicopters is also considered challenging, but more feasible. Implementing AGFS directly into a new design is considered feasible for both CS27 and CS29 rotorcraft. HEFS maintenance effort and intervals is expected to be similar to normal EFS maintenance. Now, when we look at the overall recap of our conclusions, our key takeaways are, one, the revised tapered air pocket definition enables a feasible design of the HEFS that ensures adequate air pocket for enhanced occupant survivability in both CS-27 and CS-29 reference aircraft. The CS-27 will not achieve a stable side floating attitude, only a fully capsized attitude. The CS-29 will achieve a stable side floating and uh, capsized attitude. Industry standard fabric and composite materials have demonstrated the ability to retain performance at elevated temperatures and preliminary endurance testing has also demonstrated favorable results. The CFD analysis suggests HFS installation can comply with relevant CS27 CAD A and CS29 requirements with minimal effects on static stability, rate of climb and fuel consumption. A survey of the current CS27 CAD A offshore fleet has shown that installation of a retrofit HEFS will be challenging. However, retrofitting a CS29 helicopter is also considering challenging, but as I mentioned, more feasible. Im implementation of the HEFS directly into the new design is considered to be feasible for both CS27 and CS29 rotorcraft. And a failure to deploy rate of 10 to the minus seven per flight hour is also feasible when factoring a 30% chance of capsizing within five minutes or four to the minus six per flight hour when not factoring in a 30% chance of capsizing within five minutes. In terms of the overall conclusions, we've developed a quick visual chart here where it basically highlights what I just stated. So the big takeaway here is we do feel it is feasible for retrofit on a larger CS-29 aircraft and a new design for a CS-27 and a CS-29. 
However, retrofitting an existing CS-27 aircraft does pose significant challenges uh, to the industry. So with that being said, I would now like to hand back the presentation to Emma. Thank you, Mike. So I'll now give a summary of the benefits of this research activity, or in other words, the potential way forward. So as a reminder, EASA published an MPA in 2016 for public consultation that included the introduction of an air pocket for initial airworthiness. This consultation highlighted technical challenges to be resolved, which led to the launch of this research activity. As explained by Mike, this research has confirmed the feasibility of the installation of HEFS to provide an air pocket. It has also assessed the cost and complexity of such an installation. And the final report will contain proposals for EASA consideration for rulemaking. In addition, after the NPA publication in 2016, EASA received a safety recommendation following the Super Puma accident in the North Sea in 2013. This recommended that EASA update CS29 to include side floating capability for helicopters in the event of a water impact or capsize. The requirement for retroactive implementation was also recommended. So considering the original MPA, together with the results of the research activity and the safety recommendation, we have sufficient aspects to consider the launch of a rulemaking activity. So before starting a rulemaking task, we will perform a preliminary benefit analysis with the original MPA data, the data from the related retroactive activity in 2020, and the results of this research. If this benefit analysis justifies a rulemaking activity, rulemaking task 120 phase three will be launched with an update of the EPAS. A more detailed benefit analysis will then be carried out for initial airworthiness. If successful, an MPA will be published for public consultation. The target date is Q3 next year, with subsequent update of potentially CS27 and or CS29 in the first half of 2025. Assessment of the retroactive implementation of the air pocket is targeted to start at the end of next year. If successful, the MPA is targeted for publication in Q3 2025 for public consultation. This may lead to publication of an EASA opinion and eventual update to part 26. So I want to highlight though, if at any point the benefit is not justified, this rulemaking process will not continue. As a separate activity, the means of compliance to SC VTOL related to ditching operations will be updated based on the results of this research as appropriate. This will be at the beginning of next year. So the results of the research has already provided a qualitative benefit analysis. So considering our different categories of rotorcraft, we have the small CS27, larger CS27 category A and CS29. It's clear the larger the rotorcraft, the bigger the benefit from the air pocket as we have a bigger number of passengers. The research has demonstrated the smaller the rotorcraft, the increasing technical challenges to implement the air pocket. We can also compare initial airworthiness to retrofit. Again, the research has shown that the retrofit activity has increasing cost compared to initial airworthiness and also increased technical challenges. So the main message is that the least likely option is a retroactive application on CS27 and the most likely option is initial airworthiness implementation for CS29. But again, we have to first carry out the benefit analysis to see if this is justified. So to conclude, the research project has concluded that solutions are feasible to answer the technical issues raised. Following a benef initial benefit analysis, the rulemaking task 120 at phase three may be reopened with initial airworthiness assessed in the first step, followed by retroactive implementation assessment. Again, if the benefit is not justified, the rulemaking task will not continue. It's clear from the research that implementation for CS29 has increased benefits and less technical challenges compared to CS27. And initial airworthiness implementation has less cost and less technical challenges 
compared to retroactive implementation. If we are to continue with the rulemaking activity, the original text in the MPA 2016 will need to be revised based on the recommendations of this research. So, for example, the smaller air pocket and potentially also the emergency exits below the waterline, but reachable. And of course, independently, the SCV toll MOC will be updated according to the research recommendations as appropriate for EV tolls requiring ditching certification. So we now move over to our question and answer session, and I will pass over to Willie. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Emily and uh, Mike, for your great uh, presentations. Now, colleagues, it's up to you. Uh, you you are probably saw already in the uh, website that we have a slide or used uh, to raise question and answers. Uh, here again is uh, the website uh, address, the event code and the bus code, and I have also uh, put uh, all this data into the chat. Uh, when I understand the system here correctly, uh, you can also vote uh, for the different questions and those questions which have uh, most votes or which came earlier uh, on the top. I start with the first question, if this is fine for you. It's from Sabine and Sabine raised the question, did you also consider inadvertent deployment during rain or splashes in pools or rain water? I think, Mike, this will be up to you. Sounds good, really. So Sabine, a uh, very interesting and uh, relevant question here. So I think the way I would answer that question is the, the intent of the design of the HEFS pods would be quite similar to the existing EFS systems, which all of the critical components associated with the actual activation of the float are hermetically sealed. So that will play a key part in ensuring no inadvertent activation, even in um, salt water, for example. I think that would be my primary suggestion on that one. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. The next question is from David. Uh, and the question is, although the EC135 did not side float, was the resulting air pocket sufficient? I think, Mike, it's again up to you. Yes, uh, another great, great question. And uh, I guess I apologize for not covering it fully on the uh, illustrations in the slide. So yes, let's, let's talk about for a second here, both CS27 and 29. So on the EC135 CS27, as you can see in the image, the aircraft is sitting very much nose down in the fully capsized position. I can confirm that the simulated computer results do indicate a sufficient air pocket in the CS27 cabin, even though there is no stable side floating attitude. Now, when we talk about the CS29 aircraft, the side floating position does provide a larger air pocket for the occupants. And it is believed that in a capsizing event, the side floating position may be the most likely position that the aircraft will end in. If it does move to a fully capsized position, I can also confirm that the air pocket will be sufficiently large, which was also validated with the real world testing. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I move on with a question from Pascal, who, who actually received a lot of uh, terms up. Was the drop test shown during presentation representative of the real teaching maneuvering? Was the inertia of the EUT comparable with the real role inertia of the helicopter? So I think in, in this instance, I think it's important to note that the mass and center of gravity of the test fixture was representative of an EC-1, uh, for, sorry, for an AW-139 aircraft. What we did observe while conducting the test was that the role inertia beyond about 63 degrees from a horizontal floating position would result in the aircraft returning to a stable upright position. Beyond the point that's shown in the video earlier, the aircraft would tip to the side floating position. Next question is Hi, Willie, regarding yes. the ditching, ditching entry question. So that was slightly out of scope of this research. The idea is the HFS will be deployed after you've already ditching 
ditched and the um, real life testing was more to simulate a, simulate a capsize event and not the actual ditching entry. Thank you, Emily. Uh, the next question is from Martin. The inflated bag is within 100 millimeter of the road disc. The bags moved dramatically in the video. Does the 100 millimeter include the movement on of the bag? Another another great question here, and there's a lot of factors that play into the answer here. So some things to consider that tie into your question are the assessment is done with a fully inflated float bag. Now, obviously, during the event of inflation, we may have a period of between one and three seconds where the float fabric is not taut, which will result in reduced clearance uh, with the rotor. It's also very important and a big lesson learned as part of our testing project was that appropriate retention is absolutely critical in, into ensuring that the position of the aircraft when resting on the water remains as close to the simulated results as possible. So you need to ensure that the float bags are very taut and appropriately retained to the aircraft structure to prevent that type of movement. And in addition, if I may add to that as well, because the flotation is linked to the low rotor speed, it's considered it's minimizing the risk of having a puncture due to the rotors turning. Correct. So yes, to, to clarify, the intent is nothing would inflate until the rotor comes to a fully stopped position. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Pascal. Have the waterline evaluations been done considering the flooded condition of the helicopter and the deformability of the floats? So that was the main aspect why we wanted to perform real world testing. So the computer simulations do take into effect uh, what I was defining earlier as uninflated float bags, where we have a, a compartmentalized float, let's say between three and six sections. What we did is we assessed the most damaged or the most critical portion of that float. The simulation was assessed with it uninflated, and then we repeated the same actions in the real world test to validate the uh, similarity between the real world results and the simulation. And we have another question from Martin. Uh, was the weight delta included in the performance impact calculations? I'm, I'm afraid, Martin, I'm not sure I fully understand the, the question. So the performance impact was mainly based on the aerodynamic delta. The weight information is given uh, more as an information on the delta, so it would have an understanding of how much less equipment you would have to include in the rotorcraft. And I think we'll pull in uh, one of our aerodynamic experts to help assess the answer to that question. So I'd like to quickly introduce you to Luca. Hello, everyone. So that's a very great question. And to answer that, we, for performance evaluation, we only consider the maximum takeoff weight. And uh, this basically um, is a fixed parameters, and we consider the additional weight uh, as corresponding to less payload included in the aircraft, as Emily suggested. So the number of max the, of the characteristic weights of the helicopter were fixed for the purpose of the analysis. Thank you, Luca. Thank you. Another question from Pascal. The distance of the float from the rotor was around 150 millimeter. Was uh, or did the study consider the deformability of the float when it was subject to floating loads? So I think this ties into my my previous uh, answer. So the computer simulated study does partially take that into consideration, but what we notice is that it's absolutely critical to perform real world testing in order to validate the deformation of the float bags and to validate the computer simulated results. So what you can see for our, for our final conclusions where we can account for appropriate air pocket space on the CS-29 aircraft, 
uh, we can confirm that has that has been validated and it has taken deformation into consideration. I think uh, one other important aspect of that is on the CS-29 aircraft, where there is a stable side floating position, it's also important to consider that the float bag will be resting against the side of the aircraft structure, which helps reduce uh, potential deformation. Thank you. We move on uh, with a question from Bradley, which received quite a number of uh, thumbs up. Is there a risk that in a higher sea state, the capsized helicopter can continue to roll? I would say, I, I guess I can't say that that was ever covered as part of the actual simulated results. Um, I think the likely answer to that is it's, it is possible depending on the sea state or the wave conditions. I think a further analysis to that would, would need to be performed in, the, in order to give you a concrete answer to that. And that's an important point that was also addressed in the original MPA. There was a requirement to demonstrate, probably through model testing, that there wasn't a risk of continued rolling and there was a stable, um, stable side floating or fully capsized position, even with a higher sea state. But that's something, again, as part of our rulemaking, we would review the text. But it's an important point to include. Thank you. We move on with a question from Tim. Was there any testing or design consideration analysis to avoid inadvertent deployment during routine system testing, often carried out by night shift maintenance staff? I think in this particular instance, I would like to defer to one of my colleagues who's a reliability expert. Garnet Karkovin is going to uh, step in to support answering that question. Okay, so yes, the the system will be armed only when when the rotorcraft is uh, operating and the RPM system uh, uh, is active. So you will not get that unless the system is active and there's present RPM present. Um, or no, sorry. RPM will be down. So the system will not be armed during its activities. Um, there will be lockouts incorporated in any design that does not uh, ha have sufficient lockouts. Sorry. Thanks, Brian. Right. Thank you. We move on with another question from David. Did the heat study allow for the float bags being stowed under protective covers? So in order to try to perform the heat testing in the most conservative fashion, we didn't add any additional protective covers. So if, if the question is referring to protective covers as insulation material, um, that is not something that we assessed. We wanted to determine if the float fabric was capable of withstanding the worst case situations. However, it is absolutely worth noting that if lightweight insulation materials could be included into the pod structure, that that would likely benefit the longevity of the components contained within. Thank you. Uh, we have now an anonymous question. In the emergency exit slides, you only displayed the passenger cabin emergency exits. Did you consider the pilot escape exits in your analysis? In my experience with the AW139, the pilots cannot exit via the passenger cabin exits. Emily, did you want this one? You want me to get through here? No, so that was um, out of sight, the scope of the research. The research was really focusing on the passengers inside the cabin for this particular project. And you're right, yes, the pilot and co-pilot would exit out of their own emergency exits. That would be something that would have to be looked at during a certification project. But the main concern here was blocking the passenger emergency exits. Thank you. Uh, another question from Pascal. Have been evaluated any safety issues occurred during a capsizing and coming from an interference between the air pocket floats and life raft mooring line? 
that was again outside a little bit outside the scope of this research activity we didn't look at compatibility with the life raft installation and the mooring lines that again would have to be something looked at at a certification project level it wasn't part of the five key questions for the research activity but it is an important point that would have to be evaluated thank you uh, we move on from a question from saint -Fran. Uh, how is the impact of the various seed is uh, of the I'm um, sorry of the various seed sea states considered on the stability of the aircraft inside float position? Again, so that wasn't looked at in the scope of this research. The stability analysis was really focusing on the demonstration as shown in the video. This would have to be looked at in the certification activity and the NPA from 2016 already included some consideration of that. So it would be model testing again, potentially in a wave tank to show that there is a stable side voting and it wouldn't continue to roll. Again, it wasn't one of the five key questions for the research project. And then uh, I see a great question here regarding the, the rotor RPM clearance. So is the intent to also not activate unless there is an inversion? Uh, that was actually one of the initial design intents of the system to prevent it from activating in, until a certain angle was uh, achieved. Now, through an iterative design process, the team did determine that it would be most appropriate to have the HEFS inflate upon water immersion, regardless of the angle of the aircraft to help proactively prevent the aircraft from uh, rotating to a capsized position. So inclinometer sensors are not part of the current design intent. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question, which is also linked to, uh, okay, now we have now another one. <laughs> we'll so from Thomas, uh, what, what about unintended deployment? The main floats inflation is tested in flight. Will this be the same for the new flotation devices? That's certainly not the intention because the demonstration is no inadvertent deployment demonstrated as uh, less frequent than 10 to the minus nine per flight hour, which I'm not sure is fully the case for the main floats, which is why there may be a demonstration in flight. But there certainly it wouldn't be an intention if you can prove no inverted deployment in flight. We move on the mark. Can you please explain why you wait for rotor RPM to decay or drop to zero before deployment? Having flown a number of helicopter types offshore, I've never seen this in any flight manual of the S-76, AS-365, AW-139. There was never a rotor RPM limit for flotation deployment for existing designs. Yes, and you're completely correct with that statement. And maybe to, to clarify further here, there is arming logic to the HEFS system. So the primary intent of the system would it, it to be uh, anonymous, uh, autonomously activated. So the aircraft would touch down on the water, the primary floats would be inflated at that time, and then as the rotor slows to a stopped position, then the HEFS would inflate. So you're correct with the statement that the primary floats may be inflated as you're passing through the ditching maneuver, but it wouldn't be until the rotor RPM reaches a sufficiently slow speed before the HEFS would inflate. And that is primarily to increase the likelihood of um, having clearance between the HEFS and the rotor to prevent unintended damage of the HEFS. So just to add to that, the intention of the installation of the HEFS is not to modify the primary floats flight manual instruction. So the primary floats um, functionality and deployment will be as it normally is for that rotorcraft type. The HEFS only, the high floats, are linked to the rotor speed. Thank you. Um, we move on with a question uh, which goes like that. Is the effect of needing to do daily removal for a rescheduled and unscheduled MGP and engine maintenance and hums fault finding not be a massive adversive impact on continuing airworthiness? It's a very valid statement. Yes, it, it will be extremely challenging on retrofit aircraft 
to develop a system that eliminates all interference with scheduled maintenance. However, for a new aircraft that's being developed, we do feel confident that systems can be designed to allow access ports, cowlings, and hinges to not interfere with uh, an HEFS system. Would it be possible to design an HEFS that would wrap around the hoist to provide additional forward buoyancy and prevent the hose down attitude? Yes, so as you could see, primarily on the CS27 aircraft, that's the one that really sits at a nose down attitude. So if we're able to build a, a wraparound style of float that would encompass the hoist, that may be one of the possible design options, but anything that can be done to move the buoyancy of the floats as forward as possible would result in a better floating position uh, of the aircraft post capsize. Thank you. Then I think it's more a statement. The usable passenger volume looks very small, especially when the passengers have to release their harness when inverted, then maneuver upwards to breath inside the air pocket while avoiding the obstructions of seats and other passengers and the risk of passenger passenger impacts, having lost any reference to exits. Yes, so really the aim of this study is to improve our current design. So the cabin size and the passenger to passenger interface and the obstruction of seats is exactly as we currently have. There has been accident data that's shown that in some capsize events, passengers have inadvertently by chance found themselves in an air pocket. So we know that does help survivability. Of course, the instruction is not going to be go to the air pocket. The instruction is going to be get out of your exit as quickly as possible if you can. The air pocket is just an additional safety feature that we think will provide people extra time and a higher chance of surviving a capsize or survivable water impact. Thank you. Question from David. Did you consider any asymmetric HEFS configurations, potentially half the weight, although reduced redundancy? David, I, I hope that I'm interpreting your question correctly. And I guess the first half of that question pertaining to the asymmetric HEFS configuration, um, I, I believe you're referring to the design or the shape of the HEFS. And in that instance, uh, it wasn't considered as part of this study, but it, it could obviously be designed in the future to account for a center of gravity that is not uh, about the center line of the aircraft. And in terms of the second half of, of your, your question regarding reliability, I believe it's a fair statement to say that most of the components that are tied to the reliability aspects will really have uh, the most minimal weight on the system. So in this case, we're primarily talking about reliability being developed through the means of the activation system, which accounts for only a portion uh, of the total system weight. But as you can imagine, obviously optimizing the system design for weight is a, is a critical aspect of this project. Thank you. We move on to a question from Daniele. If the high mounted float will inflate at water entry, may it interfere with opening of the passengers emergency exits or with passengers evacuation with the helicopter in the expected upright position? Hi, Daniele. So the way that the existing system has been designed is that uh, egress uh, through the windows, through the doors in either the upright position or the inverted position will not be affected by the HEFS pods. Uh, that was one of the key design aspects that the team was working on uh, designing the float bags around, which ultimately ended up uh, positioning them in their current location. So to summarize, uh, no, the existing HEFS position will, will not interfere with uh, the egress path of the rotorcraft. Thank you. Was there any consideration of the longevity and position of the air pockets created? 
Ichi, for the hell, uh, for the H135 nose down, it may not be accessible by the passengers as it may be behind the rear seats. So you, that statement is correct in terms of the position and geometry of the air pocket. However, given the number of occupants in a CS27 aircraft, uh, it is confirmed that, that there will be adequate airspace for those occupants. And as Emily previously mentioned, the, the intent here is for the occupants not to remain in the aircraft. The intent would be to grab a quick breath of air, two breaths of air, and then begin uh, egressing the rotorcraft as quickly as possible. And if I add to that, one of the constraints of the research was to make sure the passengers didn't have to change seat row to get to the air pocket. So we assumed everyone stayed in their section of the cabin. And regarding the, um, the air pocket length of time, we do have other requirements introduced in CS29 at Amendment 5, which makes sure that the rotorcraft mustn't sink with the loss of the critical float unit. So putting the requirements together, the passengers should have sufficient time to orientate themselves find the exit and get out of the rotorcraft. Thank you. Next question. HEFS is aimed at being affected after a water impact. How would the water impact be defined? The water impact is defined as any entry into the water beyond that in the flight manual and beyond the certified ditching entry requirements. So typically we find we normally split them in the MPA in survivable and not survivable water impacts, but it's essentially anything below, beyond the ditching instructions. So any additional speed, any different attitude of entry, any uh, uh, sea state that's beyond that in the flight manual is considered a, a water impact. Thank you. Next question. How would you consider to increase reliability of the HEFS up to 10 minus 9 to prevent its incidental inflation in flight, considering the technology is similar to primary floats that are not at this reliability level? I think in this instance, there's going to be the, the paper published after this report that will go into more details regarding the actual design of that system. My suggestion here would be to defer, defer to the papers that are published, which will include a little bit more information on the, on the system design and how we did achieve 10 to the minus 9 uh, in terms of uh, reliability. In fact, that was actually the exam question, if you like, right at the beginning. How can you meet 10 to the minus 9 for inadvertent deployment? And the research has come up with a system design that we believe can, can reach that and actually exceed that. It's uh, very briefly shown in the block diagram earlier in the presentation. Um, and then obviously, I think Emily and I would be happy to have a more detailed conversation regarding that subject uh, after this. Thank you. Uh, I think now we have a state. Oh, something else, Emily, for you a question. <laughs> Moved just up. Towards Emily, how will the result of the research be incorporated in current rulemaking activities for VTOL aircraft outside CS27 and CS29? Okay, so the main results of this will be used for CS27 and 29. The focus really was on rotorcraft. However, we did use or we did introduce the air pocket into the SC VTOL MOC, but e-VTOLs that need to have ditching certification. And that was the original text from the MPA 2016. So what we have to do is go back and review that and have a look at specifically the air pocket size and the position of the window with respect or the emergency exit with respect to the water line. So we will be reviewing the results of this research and the MOC for e-VTOL. But again, it's only for e-VTOL for which ditching certification is necessary, not for emergency flotation or limited over water operations. Thank you. Um, I think now is a statement. Given the observed mobility of the floats during capsize, any scale model C version is test campaign as part of the subsequent rulemaking task activity must consider float mobility. Absolutely. Yes, agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question. So you are considering adding a requirement for survivable water impact to the requirements? Beyond just teaching? Uh, no, we're not. 
During the rulemaking activity, it's impossible to define a specific survivable water impact. So what we do is we improve the requirements for ditching with the knock-on effect that this will improve survivability in the case of a survivable water impact. So the air pocket will help for capsize following ditching or survivable water impact when there is a capsize situation, but we won't actually specify survivable water impact in the requirements. We do have a similar requirement for um, protection of the emergency flotation, the primary emergency flotation in the event of a crash. So we do have this already in CS29 to consider beyond ditching scenarios. Thank you. Uh, we have now a question from Safran. Does the weight impact consider the potential impact to the rest of the aircraft structure, uh, electric, electrical harness, additional sensors? For some reason, we're not seeing that question here. So sorry, Willie. Uh, every bit. Does the weight impact consider the potential impact to the rest of the aircraft? such as structure, electrical harness, additional yes. sensor. Yes, sorry, we uh, misunderstood that question initially. The, the weight impact that was assessed for both the CS27 and the CS29 rotocraft does account for the float bags, the pods, preliminary structural integration, as well as the electrical harnesses. Thank you. Then a statement from Martin. Fifth the kilogram will affect max fuel at max cross weight. Yes, exactly. And that's one of the other indications that this implementation on smaller rotorcraft will be more important in terms of effect compared to larger rotorcraft. So 50 kilograms as a percentage of the maximum takeoff weight obviously is less important for CS29 compared to CS27. But this will be have, have to be something we'll include in the benefit analysis. Thank you. A statement from David. Wave tank testing of site float floating halos has already been performed. CECA paper 97010. Yes, thank you, Dave, for the reminder. But again, if, the, if for any new certification activity, obviously the specific flotation design will also have to be checked for the stability. Then a question. Uh, for the inadvertent deployment in flights, did the research consider an uninflated deployment and subsequent clearance and interference? So we, we were defining the inf inadvertent inflation of the HEFS as a, a critical issue in, in flight. So as I previously mentioned, the clearance right now is assessed for a fully inflated uh, float. Obviously, proper retention to that float bag is critical in order to achieve, let's say, no less than 150 millimeters of clearance. Now, it's also important to note that if the float bag is not inflated or if it's in the process of being inflated, there's a lot more loose fabric available, uh, and that fabric will uh, interfere with the rotor based on its current design. Hence why uh, inadvertent reliability requirements were so critical for this program. Thank you. A statement from David. Human subject trials of escape from site floating helicopters has been successfully performed. CCA paper 2001-10. Yes, thank you, Dave. So I mentioned at the beginning there's been extensive research carried out already. Um, we've now answered the technical challenges. I think we have all the packages in place to actually restart the rulemaking activity. We obviously then have to do the cost benefit analysis to see if we continue with the rulemaking. But you're right, I think there's enough research and um, answers out there that we can continue. Thank you. We continue with a statement. One of challenges for passengers to escape during emergency while helicopter teaching on water is that the rotary blades remain operating and no alert is present once it stops. Very valid well point. Thank you very much for that. Next question. Was there any utilization of artificial intelligence technology in such a study? Very interesting. Uh, obviously, that's the way the, the world is going. But no, uh, as part of this program, no. Uh, AI was, was involved with any of the simulations. Thank you. It seems a big mode to give passengers who have an CA, EBS, another press or two. 
Yes, that's right. It is a big modification to provide an air pocket, but it has been demonstrated. Even if passengers have got an EBS, they sometimes are not able to deploy it in time, and it's just an additional safety feature to enhance survivability. Again, as part of our benefit analysis, we will be looking at, at all the previous accidents to really determine how much benefit we would have from this air pocket. It was already carried out, which is why it was published in the MPA 2016. So we will be using some of the results of that or the impact analysis of that to assess if we move forward. Thank you, Emily. There is now a comment uh, on David's uh, previous statement. Did CA paper 2001-10 consider the nose down configuration shown with an aircraft with no aisle or did it feature a side floating super boomer with an aisle? If not, what human egress testing can be conducted? I think that's more a question for, for Dave. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Dave can uh, 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 draft a, a response to that. And we uh, move on to the next one for the time being. From Sabine, does it make sense to require a design feature for safe maintenance to avoid injuries? Yes, uh, uh, obviously, uh, as always, as part of any uh, design campaign or design program, that would be one of the key aspects that need to be assessed. Thank you. Then a statement from Dave, only put high floats on one side. Yes, that wasn't uh, looked at during this research, but certainly a possibility. The problem, of course, putting it only on one side is because you have hoist and other items up there, your space is really, really limited. So to get the sufficient buoyancy in total buoyancy, you may need to use both sides, but it's a valid point that would put the rotorcraft more on one side. Next question. Do you expect any practical training for passengers as part of the helicopter underwater evacuation training? So yes, uh, the passengers in oil and gas currently have Hewitt training. This air pocket is slightly aside from the Hewitt training discussion. Again, it's another feature to improve reliability and survivability in the event of a ditching capsize or survival water impact. We do have another research project currently going on with the UK CAA, which is having a look at evacuation and occupants behaviour in the event of a capsize. And that might provide some recommendations for training or otherwise. So that's another research project. Thank you. Uh, it's now uh, we, we get again a, a number of questions and uh, they move up and down. So the next one is you mentioned that there were five questions of parameters for the study. Is that listed somewhere? So I yes, that's so. in the presentation. It's also in the tender document. Um, so yes, when we publish the presentation, if you go back to one of the introductory slides, there were five items to have a look at, which was related to can you put an HEFS to get the air pocket, aerodynamics, heat resistance, integration, and also reliability to a prevent inadvertent deployment at 10 to the minus nine. They were the five questions. Yes, and you find them on page eight of our presentation. Next question, will there be any impact to existing EFS systems to assure they will survive a capsize event? It seems like existing float system will be loaded in the opposite direction as originally intended in a capsize event. Um, it's, it's an accurate statement that's being that's being made here regarding the EFS loading conditions. So what was observed during the real world testing is that the existing float design was capable of, of maintaining those capsizing loads. However, it, it would need to be assessed as part of a full scale legitimate design campaign to obviously ensure that the existing EFS is capable of withstanding those loads or a modification may be necessary. But that would also be part of the standard primary EFS uh, certification activities. There is a requirement to consider uh, loads or events beyond the ditching scenario and also uh, loads for water entry, for example. Thank you. Most previous accidents predate CA EBS introduction, so will you evaluate their benefit retrospectively? So we'll have to have a really good look at the accident data to see what benefits we can get. What we had in the original MPA that credit shouldn't be taken for the EBS because there's been many occasions where passengers have been unable to activate it or deploy it quickly enough to get out. But that's something we will look at. We also need to have a look at ditching, 
um, the implication for ditching when it's not oil and gas. So the passengers do not have an EBS, they do not have an immersion suit, and they don't have a life jacket. It's probably in those cases where we will really get the survivability benefit. Thank you, Amity. Next question is from my colleague Emily. You mentioned a system design able to meet the no single failure criterion and extremely improbable safety objectives. Have you also addressed the common cause considerations associated with a catastrophic classification for the untimely deployment failure condition? Yes, so the, the system design was evaluated for any common cause. Uh, we used uh, Looked at the simple and non-complex components, and uh, we reviewed any any sort of common or common cause assessment during that review. Thank you very much. And we have, for the time being, three open questions or statements. Mm -hmm. um, the next one, Emily described the next stages of the rulemaking task implementation process. What will be the threshold for not continuing beyond each stage? It's a cost versus benefit demonstration. Yes, I don't want to give the exact value for a go ahead or not go ahead at the moment. We need to consult with our impact assessment colleagues to, to see the best way. And what we'll be doing is proposing options. Option one will be do nothing. Um, option one, for example, will be some partial implementation of the air pocket and moving on to full implementation. So it will be costs of implementation versus benefit, which will be potential fatalities avoided based on accident data. I don't want to commit, sorry, at the moment to the exact uh, cutoff point. Thank you, Emily. Then a statement. Additionally, it is crucial to have a technology to immediately stop the rotor blades once the helicopter ditched a water surface. I think it's an interesting but relevant point. Obviously, uh, not part of this particular research project, but I think as previously stated by uh, another comment or another question here, um, it is something that would be relevant to assess uh, as part of the capsizing event. Thank you. And uh, we always moved on to the last question, but there's another one coming up. <laughs> uh, one on eVTOL. What will be the financial impact on deploying the air pockets in the eVTOL aircraft? Okay, so the air pocket requirement is already there in the eVTOL. eVTOL aircraft obviously are brand new design. It's much more straightforward to implement that. They also are very novel designs. They're not necessarily the same as rotorcraft with a very top heavy um, CG. Um, the another point with eVTOL, of course, is it's not necessarily for oil and gas. We don't expect all the passengers to always have training, but if you are flying in a ditching scenario, you will need to have some air pocket in an eVTOL as currently written in the MOC. What we're going to do is adjust the MOC to make the air pocket smaller, so effectively making it cheaper than what we currently have. Thank you, Emily. Uh, next question from Thierry. EASA assessed the cost of site floats, symmetrical system. Supplier development was assessed as 3 million in MPA 2016-01. Are the implementation costs further to this research modified? That's a question, a good question. That's something that we'll have to look at first in the preliminary benefit analysis. So we will go back to the original cost, what the breakdown of the cost is. We'll have a look at the final report of the DART research, which is not yet available, unfortunately, nearly available. And we'll really make sure that we have a proper benefit analysis and cost analysis. I don't want to commit at this moment how much or if it would have been modified compared to the original MPA. Also, of course, the original MPA was looking at the addition of all the requirements, including this, some of the Amendment 5 requirements that are already introduced, which may actually lower the price because some of the systems or implementation we currently have may give a credit, if you like, for the high EFS. And that also has to be reviewed in detail, and that's not yet done. Thank you, Emily. It seems the last question the road, uh, from David, the rotors will stop when the helicopter capsizes. Yes. That was the assumption. So, colleagues, I don't know how many questions we had, but there were really a lot, and I think they were really very, very, very interesting, great questions. 
Um, yeah, I think as we come closer now, uh, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to Emily and to Mike, as well as all to the other colleagues uh, who uh, answered uh, questions. Uh, I think your responses, your presentations were really great. Thank you very much for that. Your expertise and uh, dedication really enriched our understanding of the safety critical subject matter. Thank you very much for that. And I would like also very much uh, to thank the audience uh, for the active participation for these many questions and statements. Your engagement has made this event a true success. Now, uh, a special note of congratulation also to our contractor, Dart Aerospace, for the outstanding work. Thank you very much for that. Your efforts have been instrumental in accomplishing this, uh, the, the project objectives and laid down the ground for exploiting now the benefits. Uh, as Emily has shown, the benefits of this project are manifold and EASA is committed to follow them up in the coming months and years. And we are confident that these efforts will yield significant advantages for all stakeholders. As said, uh, the presentation and the recordings of this webinar will be uploaded on the events page and also on the project page uh, at the ASA website. We encourage you uh, to revisit the materials and to share them with your colleagues. And uh, once again, thank you all for your time and contributions. We look forward to seeing you at our future events. Goodbye and take care.